Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this guy is Jim Gaffigan. He is an Emmy-winning, multi-Grammy-nominated not multi -Grammy nominated comedian. You have more Grammy nominations than you have children. I know. That's a lot. Yeah, and it's. I feel like it's almost, now they're doing it to tease me. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm grateful. But, you know, nominations, it sounds corny, but it is, it's great to be nominated. It's probably better to win, though, right? It probably is. I mean, I... I wouldn't know, but I would imagine. You're also a best New York Times bestselling author. I can't take that away from you. I know you from so many movies, television shows, 13 going on 30, small yet important role oh, in one of the greatest films ever created, and his numerous stand-up specials, 10 stand-up yeah. specials. This is your third now for Amazon Prime, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It is called Dark Pale, and you're also on tour, right? Or starting yes. to do a tour. So this is... Yet another one of your specials that you've done since the 2016 election, since COVID, but we are once again in a different era. You talk in this special about death, about funerals, about some really dark stuff. What has it been like going back out there, telling the story that you wanted this particular special to tell? I would say it's, uh, you know, the audience has really, well, obviously they've all gone through the same stuff, right? And we're talking and we all have had this uh, emotional development where we wanted to talk about the pandemic, didn't want to hear about the pandemic, frightened of it coming back. You know, we all occasionally will hear about somebody getting COVID and you're like, wait a minute, and, you, and we have like PTSD, right? And we've all lost someone, whether it's through the pandemic or just in everyday life. Um, and so, but the, I feel as though the, the, there's a maturity there. I mean, initially, people were just ecstatic to get out, right? And, um, but I don't know, my relationship with audiences is that, uh, you know, there is the value of time. It's, it's not even so much, I mean, my ticket prices aren't that high anyway, but I, you know, if people are giving me two hours on a Friday night, it better be worth those two hours because we don't have time. And, uh, you know, if people are making the decision, so when, I, when people walk out, I definitely want them to be like, all right, that was worth it. Because I'm the same way. It's like when I'm disappointed by a movie, it's not that it was 14 or 16 bucks. It's that I was like, oh man, that's, that's my night. Well, that's part of getting older too, right? right. Those, are, those are two hours I'm not gonna yeah. get back. I could get my money back, right? I'm not getting any younger. Right. Every special that you've done is its own moment in your life, moment in your family, moment in your career. You've done specials since the election, you've done specials even since COVID, right? You had, I think yeah. your last one was in 2020 or 21. Yeah. So yeah, I wanna know what is this, what is the feeling about this one? What was the story that you wanted this one to tell? I guess, you know, it's, some of it is uh, that uh, nihilism is, is uh, pervasive and it, maybe it's necessary for how we process today because uh, I think we have to acknowledge some of the chaos that exists and the fear that exists. And if we're not a little bit cynical, we're living in a little bit of denial. So um, I don't know, that's, that's where I see the world. But uh, you know, and it also it's like in a parallel way, um, you know, my comedy specials, my children were younger, and now they're, you know, three-fifths of them are teenagers, and it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's yes, really no, hard. I know exactly what you mean. That it's is the really, word. It's so weird, because as a parent, when you have young kids, you just, either people don't tell you how hard it is with teenagers, or you don't hear it, because... The, you know, changing a diaper is like a cakewalk compared to waiting for a teenager to come home on a Saturday night. Yeah, and there's, 
bookshelves galore about how to parent up to the age of two. Yes. And I have one who's out of college, and there are no books about how to parent an adult. Yes. And it's terrible. And there's no, there's no books on how to parent uh, a kid that's been kind of exposed to social media for six years. Right, and lived through a pandemic and had their academic life interrupted, had their childhood or their adolescence interrupted. Yeah. You, speaking of your parenting, you took your son with you on this tour. Jack, yes. Jack, who, if I'm not mistaken, gave you the title of your first book. Yes, he did. As, as well. Tell me what that experience was like, why you wanted to do this and what it was like. Well, you know, Jack, we did two uh, separate weeks of uh, tour. Some of it's I want to spend time with my uh, son, but some of it is also he's expressed interest in stand-up. He is also one of the funniest people I know. And, uh, you know, like there's, you can tell a kid something or you can have them experience it. So I was trying to, I wanted him to understand uh, the, you know, the preparation that goes into stand up. The, um, and also that there is uh, something involved in it that is not, that is outside of just kind of saying the most irreverent thing. And so we did two two week long tours, and you know I think he he learned it, but like you know there is also something of you know human beings we learn things and then we have to relearn them. But he is very funny. But it's not like he could definitely do it for a living. But it is you know there there is something about the entertainment industry, the amount of humiliation and rejection you have to consume. Not everyone has that appetite, so I don't know. I think he might, but I also know that when I was 17, you know, I've probably had 10 different lives since then, right? I feel like every five years I'm kind of a different person. Well, I want to ask you about that. And when you talk about your craft and you talk about that com comedy is not just saying the most provocative thing, you for a long time have been known as the clean comic, you're the clean yes. guy, you're the Catholic guy, you're the guy with a lot of kids, there's a certain kind of squeaky clean image that goes along with that. And yet, I've watched your stuff, you talk yeah. about death, you talk about diarrhea, you talk yes. about, and you've also you've talked about your politics, you've talked about your beliefs, you've talked about yeah. where, you, where you stand on social issues. That runs, I think, in some ways contrary to that image what's that about i think some of that is you know the entertainment industry is perception and in a lot of ways you don't have control over that and in a lot of ways it's none of your business right so i remember initially a kind of being resistant to being known as the clean comedian just because, uh, you know, the only adjective that really matters with stand-up is funny. But, uh, you know, and I remember going, thinking, you know, well, I have, like, in one special, I had, like, five minutes on cancer. And people were like, he's still clean. He talks about food. So it's like you, you don't have uh, uh, control over what people will take away or what people will... Uh, assigned to you uh, and so it is it, it's a strange thing where I you know I kind of go with the flow and I also you know it's like I've had numerous acting roles yet w with every acting project people are always like what's it like to be an actor and these are intelligent people that have seen my IMDB page but in their perception I am a guy who only tells jokes about food. So it's, some of it is, it doesn't bother me and it's not, it's not an indication of uh, someone not doing their research, it's just the perception. Is it more perception from people on the entertainment side? When you go out and you're talking to audiences and they know yeah. you and they know the things you talk about, has there been a shift in the last couple of years when you have been a little more vocal about where you stand on certain issues? Or is it, do they know you? Do they know that that's what I you're gonna? Yeah, I think that they, um, 
I mean, I, I think there's two answers to this. One, <clears throat> I do like the idea of kind of, um, you know, what, what would be the kind of like, not thinning the herd, but like um, purifying it a little bit. Like, so if I say something that uh, the, the, the setup is like, we all agree in gay rights, right? So like, and then I just do another observation. If, th if that initial statement turns people off, it's like, that's fine. Do you know what I mean? But on the other side of it, I do feel like people are, um, the relationship I have with people that come to my shows is that um, they don't necessarily have to agree with everything uh, as long as I'm, you know, I'm not preachy. Like in, in Dark Pale, I have stuff about global warming. And when you travel around the country doing material, you can get a different sense with how an audience is taking in a premise. And so there are times when, I, not a majority, but you can feel someone in the audience, when I'm talking about global warming, someone in the audience will be like, all right, I don't necessarily agree with this premise, but I think you're funny and I want to see your take on this. So it is, there is something kind of, it's, you know, in this divided America that we live in that is this nostalgia for, uh, you know, we don't necessarily agree with everything, but it's, it's, a, it's a decent vehicle for comedy, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? It does. And, you know, when you talk about your audience, I'm always so fascinated with the way that you use the voice of the audience in your act and you've been doing that for yeah. a long time you switch back and forth yeah. you've been doing that you become us yes. you get inside our heads yes. it's a unique to you device that you've been doing for a long time but that voice has changed over the year like the actual sound yeah. of it has changed oh yeah yeah it what, is what is that voice now how do you tap into that how do you what is what do we sound like to you now yeah, well, it's interesting because I would say that, and how I use that, because it's initially when I started stand up, I'm this slow talking Midwesterner, and I was in New York City in the early 90s, and this is before YouTube or satellite radio. And so stand up was closer to combat than what it is now. The audience wasn't as educated on what stand-up is or even how to consume it and so it was kind of a tool of of just always talking or speaking for the audience if they had a judgment because you know i'm this white bread guy and if i went on stage they'd be like does this guy know how white bread he is it's like if i bring it up not only does it communicate self-awareness it's a shared uh like-mindedness and so but I was always, because in different hours, I'm kind of, I don't want to lean on it, but I also, it adds a element of an additional point of view, which is always fun. So if I can, if I'm, if my point of view on a topic is pro it, then the inside voice can be against it. And so that way, it, it also, it's just a great way of, diffusing a situation I, and I did it when I was a teenager it's just you know people just feel at ease where it's like all right he at least he knows he's late you know what I mean <laughs> he know he knows what what our our counterpoints might yes. be I want to ask you one more thing because you've been talking about your family as long as you've had one which is yeah. over 20 years now as you said your kids are getting older now they're yeah. transitioning into adulthood how do you balance now how you talk about them do they get any veto power in what you say how do you create good boundaries so that they feel safe yeah i mean it is it's 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 really kind of uh it's this moving target right because you never want to go full Kardashian. And you also, we live in such a voyeuristic, exhibitionist era that if you are not revealing some of yourself, 
you're not going to develop a relationship with the audience. So I do, uh, my, uh, my general approach on parenting is that if a parent is complaining, it means they're involved. And um, I'm not hiding anything from my children. So like it is hyperbole, but it is also, it's weird because it's like one of those things where a 10 year old's view on having a, a father that's a comedian is different from like a 17 year old's. You know, like that's a different type of bag. I mean, my dad was like a small town banker. So I am aware of it and I would never, um, I would talk about my children as opposed to a specific ind individual, or if it was a specific individual, there, and if I'm highlighting their behavior, it would be something that they would, uh, they would like. Do you know what I mean? It would be them standing up to authority in, uh, you know, an empowering way as opposed to like the behavior of like making them embarrassed. Yeah. They're, my kids are more worried about uh, a, a photograph being posted than, um, uh, you know, me. And I would never spe specify them. But it is interesting because we do live in this day and age where some of their peers are really into comedy or their families are really into comedy. And they might have an awareness, and then some kids are not into comedy, and they would not, uh, it would never come up. So it's interesting, and it's not necessarily, you know, comedy is something that's enjoyed by everyone, so it's, it doesn't hit a particular type of kid. It could be an athlete, it could be, you know, uh, you know someone that really excels in academics, it doesn't really, and not that those, are mutually exclusive. And plus you live in New York City. Like yeah. all the kids' parents have Emmys. Yeah. Right? Well, no. Well, it's like, it is also one of those things where, I mean, I'll run into, uh, <clears throat> you know, my kids' friends when I'm doing shows because they're going on stage. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's you know, it's a strange thing in New York City, right? <laughs> or I'll be auditioning for something and I'll see some kid's parent, you know? So it's, New York City's a small world. It's a small, strange world with full of small, strange apartments. Jim yes. Gaffigan, thank you so much for talking thank to me. You. Congratulations on this wonderful, beautiful, hilarious new special. Thanks so much. And we can see you on tour. Thanks so much, appreciate okay. it.